Hello, good day, Fries here. And this is just a quick video showing you the best route of becoming a ranger. Well, in my opinion, anyway. I remember years ago when I was trying to be a ranger, it's quite hard to get a ranger job and to be in the industry. So I just want to put up a step-by-step -step guide on the best route that I believe uh, you'll have the best chance of becoming a ranger. So a little bit about me, I've been a ranger for almost 10 years, uh, currently working for the local authority. Previous to that, I would worked for the National Trust and the Forestry Commission. And previous to my working life, uh, I studied countryside management. So I went to college, I went to college at the a local campus where I studied countryside management and that opened up the doors to me then into the industry and I uh, extended my education and went on to Aberystwyth University and again study countryside management. So with that said, with my work experience and my education, I think I'm qualified to give uh, my view on uh, how I think it's best to become a ranger. So I'll just go into a step-by-step -step program here and um, take notes if you want to or just watch the video again. So, school years, I'm assuming uh, this video is going to be assuming that he's 16 and still in school, but if not, the content is still relevant if you're older because you're going to go into training later on. So, I'm not put pressure on you. If you're at the GCSEs level, 15, 16, or even A levels, the decisions you make now will affect the rest of your life. So, I don't want to put too much pressure on you there. But don't waste those young years because they're very, very important for later on in life. Now, I'm not giving out uh, specific advice here on how to be successful, how to make lots of money. This video is specific on how to become a countryside ranger or park ranger. So, it's very important you get a good qualification, get your A-levels in, or if you're not doing A-levels, go to college, get a HND, because employers now they want their rangers to have a degree so they're looking for uh, a foundation degree or a full degree it's actually a part of the paperwork when you're applying for a ranger job now if you're older you can bypass that and because it normally says degree or relevant experience so if you're older and you've got relevant experience in the field then that's fine but if you're young and you want to become a ranger then not 100 percent but more than likely you will need a degree within the countryside sector. So what I did, I didn't do A-levels in school, I went straight to college. So I specialised in countryside management really early and I'd recommend you do the same because when you go on to university then you get your degree, you're familiar with the type of coursework that you're going to get and things are going to be a lot easier for you because you've had the two years previous experience and the work in college compared to university it's much easier and it's a good way of getting a grip to things. Just because the employer wants you to have a degree doesn't mean you need a full one. Now I've got a foundation degree, it's not a full degree and that's good enough. When the employers write down a uh, degree they don't actually mean full degree and I'll explain. So when I went to Aberyst Aberystwyth University I did what's called a foundation degree so it's a practical degree course. So it's one year in college, then one year work experience, then your last year back in university again, and you pass. Now with my previous work experience, I didn't need to do the three years. So I did my, I did my university degree in two years. So I saved a year of my life, uh, not needing to go to university or doing work experience. So if you're really young and you get the work in early, you can go to university, as long as they're still doing the same course that I did, you can do it in two years instead of three, and that's very beneficial. The good thing about that degree is it's job specific, so it's designed for the countryside sector, for countryside jobs. And it doesn't matter how good you are as an academic, there's no substitute to actually doing the work. So if you've actually done the work, your employer is going to be able to see that. He's going to know you're going to adapt well to the training. You've already done most of it. And I feel that's probably the best route in, if we're talking about education, and you want to be a countryside ranger, is do the foundation degree because it is a practical course. It's not all coursework. And it's a really good route in, and that's the route that I took. 
Now, if you want to get a full degree, that's fine. You can still you get a full degree and you can still be a ranger, no hands down, that's the truth. But if you are going to do a full degree, then you want to get some extra work experience in, so you've got something to show on your CV that you've actually done the work and you know what you're doing. Because unfortunately, in this day and age, the it's so competitive going for jobs that employers always put down, they want to see experience. When you're young, you haven't got the experience, so when you do need degree, get the experience in, and that's going to help you out in a long way. Right, some big advice here. When you're in school, 16 years old plus, start working. Get a summer job straight away. I work every summer, all the way through full-time education. You don't want to waste those years. Very, very important. Because like I just mentioned, when you're applying for a job, they always write on it experience. And that's the biggest problem young people have got. They get the fantastic degree, first class honours degree, etc. They think they're going to walk into a job, but they haven't done the work, they haven't got experience, and they don't get the job over someone who might not be as qualified uh, academically, but experience-wise, they beat them hands down and they get the job. To as employees, you don't want to spend a fortune and a huge amount of time training individuals up to do a job. So if you can go then, you say half trained, where it's half the money, it's half the work for your employer to actually train you up to become a full-time ranger, and that's crucial. And even at 16, I'm not expecting you to get a countryside-related job at 16, but any job. So you've got something on your CV that shows you're willing to work, you can be at work, your attendance is good, and you get a good review or a reference then to go on your CV when you're applying for a job. Very, very important that you work that you work in from 16 plus old every summer. It doesn't have to be full-time, part-time job will do, but you just got to have some work experience on your CV, especially if you're young and you want to become a ranger as a young person. Right, training. <clears throat> so, when you're applying for a ranger job, they want you to have some basic training. So I've highlighted some training which I think is compulsory. Now it's not 100% compulsory, but if you've got this basic line of training, you're going to tick all the boxes on the job application form. So the first one is chainsaw. CS3031, that's what it was called when I did mine. And that's your basic chainsaw. You can cross cut and fell trees up to 15 inch. And that's a good a basic entry chainsaw course that you want to do when you're young. If you're in college, most college offer that you can do it through the college and I definitely, definitely, 100% recommend you do that. Second end is brush cutter. When you brush cut the instrument paths, keeping these footpaths open, keeping these country paths open, streaming or brush cutting is a huge aspect of that. The terrain is so awkward, you can't actually get a flail or a track down a lot of these paths. It's actually a hand job when you do it, so brush cutter is another a uh, compulsory one that uh, if you get the chance to do, I definitely do that if you're serious becoming a ranger. Now, the third one is pedestrian flail. Not so handy for footpaths, etc. But if you want to be a country park ranger, lots of flat areas, then a pedestrian flail qualification will definitely help you out there. And the last one is trailer towing. If you're an old boy, back in the day, you pass your driving test and you automatically get your towing license with it. Now we've actually got to do a towing license as a separate driving test. Now, as the ranger, you're always towing mowers, diggers, heavy machinery, material to site, and you're going to need that trailer test. Now, if you've got that trailer towing test, I think it's 600, 700 pound. If you can do that yourself, or get the college to help you do it, or to get some kind of funding or grant to help you there, that's going to be very beneficial to you because. If you're an employer and you're looking at someone's training and they're going to need to tow, then you're going to have to factor that training in and, and that might be an extra cost that they have on the account there for. So if you've got that, that's really going to help you out. Now bonus training, got some bonus training here. Now I haven't classed this as compulsory, but everything you know, if you've got it, you're adding to the reservoir of talent that you've got, that you can prove that you know, you've actually done the work and this will might be on the tipping scale if it's between you and someone else this training here is going to allow you to become the ranger get the job instead of someone else so pesticides tractor dumper 
excavator. Now I just want to say quick about excavators. If you're a good excavator driver, you're the biggest stud on site. On any workplace, if there's a good excavator driver there, he's the main man. Because that driver is going to save everybody else a huge amount of work. Just by getting a site spot on, he's able to carry all the material for the ground workers. Excavator driving is probably one of the best skills that you can get if you see about working outside, working outdoors, ground maintenance or as a countryside ranger. Being a good excavator driver is absolutely crucial. And if I had my time back again when I was young, 17, 16, I would have done more and followed the excavated driving route just to become a lot better than what I am actually now because I was quite late learning how to drive a machine. Um, I was in my mid-twenties, not only full-time or anything, but when we get guys in to help us out uh, and they're full-time digger drivers, oh, they're complete studs. You know, you can look at the ground, the incline into bogs and you think, oh, there's no way you can get through there and those guys can do it just because of the level of training they've had and the amount of time that they've been on that machine so that's crucial there if you want to work outside get your excavator training done another handy one is hedge laying dry stone walling might be benefit fencing is another crucial one if you're working in the countryside you're putting in gates you're putting in cells you're putting in bridges there's livestock in pretty much every field in the UK so if you put in a hole in a hedge you need to be able to fence that back so learn how to fence that's absolutely crucial. And another one uh, which I didn't think of at the time but it's very very important is your ability to public speak. So for example if you're employed by a local authority, government or someone like the National Trust you're representing them on site so they might send you to meetings, they might ask you to do school group talks, um, county council meetings in the nights you want to be able to present yourself in the best possible way because you're not actually representing you, you're actually representing your employer. And you want to be able to carry yourself professionally and the only way to do that is get experience, public speaking. Um, you know, if you're in the young farmers, they do public speaking competitions. And throw the university or college, put yourself forward. I know this is what I struggled with a lot at the start. I was really shy, uh, struggling to talk to big groups audience. But the more you do it, the easier it gets and being able to speak publicly will help you out in any uh, job, any career route that you take. Um, that's, that's, that's a big point there. So it's not compulsory, but if you're a good public speaker, you can do PowerPoint presentations, etc. That's going to help you out in a long way. And just a note there, range of jobs are so rare. So when they do come up, there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of people going for it. So the more of this training that you can get, so when that job actually comes up, you're ready for it, is you're going to be at a much higher advantage of getting the job. Because not just education, training, and what you can actually do is a massive part of it. So what kind of jobs are out there? So there's two types of rangers. <clears throat> Type one, you're working on, on an established site, so you might be based at a country park, etc., or an estate. So all the infrastructure is in place, all the paths are currently there, you've got the visitors' numbers going there currently, you're working on land that your employer owns. So, for example, education ranger, country park ranger would fall under that category. Now, type two, this is what I do. So you're working on paths that's not on the ground, so you're doing pioneer clearing. There's no infrastructure there. There's nothing being, there might have been nothing there for 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years maybe. And you're working on land that your employer doesn't own. So there's a lot of negotiating. You've got to look after the ground better so you can't make a mess because it's not actually your ground. You're building new green spaces, you're building new countryside, so everything's from scratch. It's not actually there. You're actually stage one pioneer putting it in. Now both are very good jobs, they're both very similar pay. It's up to you which direction you want to take. There's a lot more of the type 1 range of jobs out there. The type 2 is a lot rarer so if you're already working say in a national park there's not going to be many type 2 ranges there because 
the network's already in place that was done a long time ago. In Wales, network's not as advanced as what it is in maybe some parts of England and some parts of the National Park, so within Pembrokeshire, that's quite close to me. The infrastructure is already there in the National Park, so it'll just be the maintaining what's actually there. Other parts of the county, uh, Fort Batman hasn't been there for that long, Everything it's just starting to come through. There's going to be a lot of Type 2 range jobs out there where you're actually creating all this facility. So, who employs rangers? Well, the local authority, which is government run. That's a good option. I'd probably say that's one of the, the highest paying range of jobs as well when you're actually working for the government, working to, for, through your local authority and you're actually doing uh, footpath work, new country parks, green spaces, etc. Now, another uh, good employer is charity groups or, or non-for-profit organisations. So you've got National Trust, Woodland Trust, with the Wildlife Trust, they employ a lot of rangers to manage their sites. What's the benefits of being a ranger? Well, first of all, you're working outdoors, you're out there with nature every day, and it's a great way of life. It's healthy work, it keeps you fit, it's no need to join the gym because you're working hard in the day, you're burning calories, and more than likely you're going to have a good body and you're going to be looking great doing it. So essentially you're going to be gardens of the countryside. So you're looking after the countryside, you're looking after the rights of way network, you're looking after these country parks and you're keeping it to a standard that the public wants and you're encouraging people to use the countryside and that's exactly what being a ranger is all about. You want people to be able to go into the countryside and enjoy it and to see the fruits of your labour. And the standard of life is good, you know. You know, waking up in the morning, you, don't, you know, you actually want to go to work, you're not dreading going. It's a great job, it's a great standard of life, and it's a lifestyle job as well. So similar to farming, really, it's a lifestyle job, and um, that's the massive benefit of the job. And it hardens you up as well. When you're outside all day in the weather, it hardens you up. So you're not that cold, you don't mind the rain so much, because you've built up a resistance to it because you're out there every day. You know what? The same as any job, there's downsides to every job. So the biggest downside really being a ranger is the low pay. The pay isn't fantastic. The pay will range between fifteen to thirty thousand depending on the type of ranger post you get. So on that kind of wage you never see rangers driving Ferraris about the place. Um, the job, you don't actually do the job for the money type of thing, you do it because you love the job. Now, you work in the cold and the rain every day, even though you're going to get hard to that, some people will find that hard, especially if you're a cold person and you get muddy pretty much every day. And some people, again, they won't find that appealing. And probably the worst part of the job, and this is honestly what I think, is the dog phone. So in the summer, you're maintaining these paths, you're mowing them open, you're streaming them, and there's dog fowl absolutely everywhere. It's disgusting. Now you see on the news and the TV, these dog groups say, oh, it's the minority that do it. Well, I can tell you now that it's not the minority. There's a large percentage of dog walkers that don't pick the dog fowl up. Because I've worked on thousands of miles of footpath, I've worked on dozens and dozens of country parks. I've visited dozens and dozens of country parks throughout the UK and the problem is absolutely everywhere. If it was the minority, you could go to a secluded side of the park, secluded side of a footpath and there'd be nothing there. But it's not the case. It's absolutely riddled. And it's getting to a point where the industry needs to clamp down on it hard because it's a real health concern and it spoils it can spoil the feel of a country park where you're taking your kids there and you don't want your kids to fall in dog fowl. But unfortunately that is a huge problem and that's something that you need to manage on the country parks, on your footpaths, on your estates. Uh, it's a big concern. So out of all the downsides of the job, being covered in dog fowl is probably the worst part of the job. But hopefully when the industry realises that that is such a big issue they're going to clamp down on it and that won't be as bad of a problem in the future. Now like any job 
just because you're a ranger, you're working outdoors, there's still paperwork. So you've got your surveys, your completion, uh, completion reports, uh, attendance sheets, fuel sheets, you've got all that paperwork to deal with. And there's lots and lots of emails. So you get emails from other organizations, other departments within where you work, and they all need attention. You've got to reply to it. And you've got to take responsibility and ownership of some complaints that come in and you've got to do something about it and then respond in a timely manner. So just because you're a ranger, you're working outdoors with tools, you've still got the paperwork and the office element to the job. And you're dealing with a lot of complaints. So you're dealing with angry people, violent people, sometimes crazy people. I remember my bo old boss telling me a story back when he was alive that he went to a farm and the farm actually came out with a shotgun, not open pointing at him, but just holding it like that with the gun open over his arm. And he did that to intimidate him, but uh, didn't work. Uh, the foot battle was opened anyway. But you're gonna find yourself in very awkward situations where you can't lose, can't lose your rag. You gotta remain cool and professional and Sometimes when people see you in a country park, they pay there to go there, they want to enjoy themselves. Some members of the public think that they can treat the park uh, wrongly and that just because they pay to go then, it's up to the range then to lay the law as such to say, this is the rules within the park, etc. So you got a bit of confrontation there and it's similar to what I do, working on these footpaths, you go on a land that you don't actually own, the landowner there might not want you to open the path up. So it could be a little bit of confrontation there. So there's quite a lot of confrontation being a ranger really. Overall, it's just managing people and how they enjoy the site and the facilities. Another big problem with the job is, most of the time, especially if you're the type two ranger, there's no toilet facilities or cleaning facilities. So I've lost count of uh, how many times I've had to hide behind a tree, do my business out on site, just because I'm half an hour away from a nearest public toilet. And it's the same with any kind of grow maintenance job. You know, you think it's 2018, the time of this recording, you know, there's no jobs out there that require you to do that. Well, there is. You know, you think all these fencing contractors work on agricultural land up in the Brecon Beacons, up on Snowdonia, yeah, there's no public toilets up there. And it's the same with being a ranger. So, and if you're looking at the video you now saying, Griffiths, whoa, stop right there that's not for me, I'm not going to do that. Well, maybe the Type 1 Ranger is a better option for you where you're working on an established site and your cooking facilities and your cleaning facilities and your toilet facilities are there on site for you. And another bad thing about the job, you eat a cold pack lunch pretty much every day. Unless you're lucky enough to pass a burger van en route to site, you're going to eat, you're going to eat cold sandwiches every day and Forget about going out to town wheat every day. That's not what the job's all about. You're actually eating your food on site normally in your pickup. So I wanted to be honest there. Everybody tells you the benefits of the job, but nobody actually says uh, the downsides of the job. So I just wanted to put that out there. Would I recommend the job? 100% yes. No ifs or buts. It takes a certain type of person to be a ranger and to do a ranger job. And if you enjoy being outside, working in the environment, working with nature, then that's a great thing to do. And it's a very rewarding job. When you finish a job, you've actually achieved something that day. You haven't just sat in the booth all day. You've actually built something, you've created something, you've opened something up for someone else to use and enjoy. And that's very rewarding. And it's great when you go back, say, a month later, go see what you've actually done and you see kids using it, people using it, the public using it, that's a fantastic feeling because what you've done, someone else is getting value out of it. And there's not a lot of jobs out there where that you can tick that box with that job and you're actually, it's rewarding yourself but it's rewarding other people as well. And even though I said the pay isn't very good and it's quite hard to work up within um, the range of um, chain of command as such because rangers are rare, ranger bosses are even rarer. But you don't have to follow that route. For example, you can change sector, so 
you can go from being a country management and instead of being a head ranger you can probably go to something like a site manager or an area manager that's a natural progression of being a ranger if you wanted to change field slightly and those are much better paying jobs if you were to go down that route but you can change job altogether so for example if you were a country ranger you can go into the highways department or a highways organization where a lot of the work is very similar but instead of working on rights of ways and paths as such you're working now on roads and highways uh, the, the two of them work very closely together even though uh, the construction uh, management and design is slightly different and you go into the into the private sector i've done that with the uh, with my honey business i took the skills and the knowledge that i learned as being a country ranger and uh, at university where i've transferred that over into creating uh, award-winning honey so obviously i knew what plants gave honey which plants the bees like and what areas those plants grow so i've used that knowledge and i've created a business out of it and i know quite a, a lot of rangers they've gone from being a ranger and they've gone into consulting so for example they're consulting on uh, building new green spaces building picnic sites uh, they're consulting on wildlife issues wildlife management concerns so there's a business there uh, on its own but what the majority do if you're going to go into the private sector is you go and contract so for example you set up a, a ground maintenance company or you go self-employed where you're doing fencing digger work uh, that type of work where you're taking what you've learned being a ranger but transferring that over to different sectors and a lot of different aspe aspects of what's out there so for example you can do gardens you can do uh, country parks you can do picnic sites you can do go work for like I mentioned Blue Stone, uh, Centre Parks etc, you go down that route maybe but not as a ranger or but to do something else as a private contractor where you help, you're helping a big organisation maintain their own site by getting a, a private contractor in so that could be very lucrative if you go down that route. If you're a ranger, most rangers remain as rangers and there's a simple reason for that is and that's because they love it, they love the job they love what it stands for and they enjoy the standard of life and there's not that many jobs out there where those jobs ticks all those boxes and there's weight in that if you're doing something that you enjoy you don't see it as work that's a good career choice and i definitely recommend uh, being a ranger based on those points right there so hopefully i've given you something to think of i'm inspired you to become a ranger if you want to follow more of me put a lot of content out on Twitter and Instagram, both in my ranger life, farm life and uh, bee business life. So please feel free to go down there and follow me if you want to find out more about me. Or if you just want to find out more about rangers, just a quick search on Twitter or Instagram. We pull up dozens of rangers. And I definitely recommend following them, especially if you're thinking of becoming a ranger. And social media is such a powerful tool that if used correctly, you can actually almost do a job from your home so you can see what it's actually like without actually applying and getting the job so say for example you want to work for the National Trust in a specific site someone on social media will be there doing that job or working in that area you can follow them through their eyes see what the day is like and you can decide then oh that looks like a nice place to work I think I'll apply for a job there so remember to do your research when you're applying for a job as well because it's not just the employer who needs to do their research and due diligence when they employ someone but you need to do the same when you apply to go work somewhere else as well it's a two-way system it's not just a one-way system so thanks for watching